Let's talk about agents. Harrison Chase, the CEO and founder of Langchain, did a talk at this Sequoia event that I made another video on a couple weeks ago where Andrew Ning did a talk also there. And Harrison's talk is also about agents and the current state of agents, what to expect from agents in the future, where they work really well, where they don't. And so let's watch it together and I'll comment on it as we go through it. So let's watch. A quick note before I get to the video, if you want a chance to win a rabbit R1, all you need to do is subscribe to my newsletter, get awesome AI updates twice a week, and stay up to date on the world of AI. I'll drop the link to subscribe in the description below, so check it out, subscribe to my newsletter, and maybe you can win this Rabbit R1. Now, back to the video. For those of you who are not familiar with Harrison, he is, as I mentioned, the co-founder and CEO of Langchain, and if you haven't heard of Langchain, let me tell you quickly about what they do. So Langchain is a super popular coding framework that allows you to basically just take a bunch of different AI tools and plug them all together really easily, the chain part. And really this was agents before agents had a term. And so of course, Harrison is incredibly knowledgeable about agents. So now let's watch the video. Thanks for the intro and, and thanks for having me excited to be here. So today I want to talk about agents. Uh, so Langchain is a developer framework for building all types of LLM applications, but one of the most common ones that we see being built are agents. Um, and we've heard a lot about agents uh, uh, from a variety of speakers before, so I'm not going to I'm not going to go into too much of a, of a deep kind of like overview, but at a high level, it's using a language model to interact with the external world. All right, I actually want to stop it right away. So one thing that I've heard quite a lot and less so lately now that agents have really become mainstream is agents are just prompts. They're just complex prompts, but that's not necessarily true. And even if it were, there's so much going on around that 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 is what makes it so special. And this is a great graph for actually understanding what's going on with agents. So you can think of the large language model as this one little piece right here, the agent itself. Then you can give that agent tools so they can have access to your calendar, to a calculator, to the web. They can do code interpreter, which means they can actually spin up environments and write and run code. And basically there's an unlimited amount of tools that you can give agents. Then we give agents memory, both short memory and long memory. So short memory, means memory between a conversation or within the conversation between agents. And long-term memory is something like RAG, for example. So retrieval augmented generation, saving information to be used later. And Crew AI, my favorite agent framework, just released both short-term and long-term memory and has shown that the agent performance has significantly improved since adding these features. So agents can also do planning, which is reflection, self-critique, chain of thoughts, sub-goal decomposition, and then they can also perform actions. So with all of these additional superpowers, agents or just the large language model prompt becomes so much more than just that. And we're gonna touch on planning in a moment because Harrison says something really interesting about it. So let's keep watching. Tool usage, memory, planning, taking actions is, is kind of the high level gist. And the simple form of this, you can maybe think of as just running an LLM in a for loop. So you ask the LLM what to do, you then go execute that, and then you ask it what to do again, and then you keep on doing that until it decides it's done. So today I wanna to talk about some of the areas that I'm really excited about that we see developers spending a lot of time in and really taking this idea of, of, uh, of an agent and making it something that's production ready and, and, and real world and, and really you know, the future of agents as the title suggests. So there's three main things that I wanna talk about and we've actually touched on uh, all of these in some capacity already, so I think it's a great roundup. So planning, uh, the user experience, and memory. So for planning, Andrew uh, covered this really nicely in, in his talk, um, but we see a few, the basic idea here is that if you think about running the LLM in a for loop, oftentimes there's multiple steps that it needs to take. So I'm gonna pause there for a second. So I've already done a video all about the Tree of Thoughts paper, which is incredible. So be sure to check it out. I'll link it in the description below. And then I haven't actually done a review of the reflection paper, but the gist is you allow a model to generate this initial response to a prompt, and then you simply feed it back and say, hey, what would you do better? And that's the very simple explanation of what it does. But essentially what we're doing is giving the models the ability to reflect, to plan ahead, to break complex tasks down into subtasks, 
And that's something that the models themselves alone can't do yet. And I've made a few videos about QSTAR and QSTAR has to do with giving the models the ability to plan and look ahead, but that's not something we have to play around with today. And in fact, just today, I released a video about the GPT-2 chatbot large language model that was mysteriously released on LMSYS and then it was actually just recently taken down. And a lot of people think that that is a model that has the ability to power agents because it does have this planning ability more so than anything we've ever seen. And I haven't necessarily seen that, but I also wasn't explicitly testing for that. But the point is agents and agent frameworks allow you to extract so much more quality, so much more performance out of of just a large language model prompt. And so when you're running it in a for loop, you're asking it implicitly to kind of reason and plan about what the best next step is, see the observation, and then kind of like resume from there and, and think about the, what, the, what the next best step is right after that. Right now at the moment, language models aren't really good enough to kind of do that reliably. And so we see a lot of external uh, uh, papers and external prompting strategies kind of like enforcing planning in, in some method, whether this be uh, planning steps explicitly up front um, or reflection steps at the end to see if it's kind of like done everything correctly as, as it should. And I've actually made a video about models that were explicitly trained to quote unquote, think slowly. And Orca is a great example of that. And Orca is a project out of Microsoft that really teaches the model how to think slowly and use a lot of these techniques, whether we're talking about reflection or tree of thoughts or other kind of slow thinking techniques automatically without us having to prompt or kind of code around the model to make it do that. I think the interesting thing here, thinking about the future, is whether these types of prompting strategies and these types of like cognitive architectures continue to be things that developers are building or whether they get built into the model APIs as we heard Sam talk a little bit about. Um, yeah, so that's really a question still, and I'm not sure. My guess is it's going to take a new architecture, something completely new beyond just the transformers architecture to allow these models to really logic and reason properly, to plan ahead, to think, to think slowly. And that's just not what they do today. So maybe that's what GPT-5 is gonna be. Maybe that's what QSTAR is, but I haven't seen any evidence that we actually have a large language model that can do that. So for now, developers are gonna have to build these tools and these strategies themselves, which is fine because companies like Crew AI make it really easy to do that. And even when models will be able to think more slowly and have these things inherently in them, agent frameworks are still going to be very valuable for coordinating different models, for giving tools, for being able to coordinate different models, coordinate different agents, give them different tools, and coordinate a very consistent workflow. Um, and, and so for all three of these, to be clear, like I don't have answers uh, and I just have questions. And so one of my questions here is, you know, are these planning prompting things short-term hacks or long-term uh, necessary components? Actually, let me know what you think in the comments. Do you think that these types of prompting techniques, reflection, tree of thoughts, are these short-term hacks and then eventually the models will just be able to do this without prompting them to do so or using external techniques or are these techniques we're gonna have to do forever? Another, another kind of like aspect of this is just the importance of basically flow engineering. And so this term I heard come out of this paper, Alpha Codium, it basically achieves state-of-the-art kind of like coding performance not necessarily through better models or better prompting strategies, but through better flow engineering. So explicitly designing this uh, kind of like graph or, or, or state machine type thing. And I think one way to think about this is you're actually offloading the planning of what to do to the human engineers who are doing that at the beginning. And so you're relying on that as a little bit of a crutch. All right, so that's a really good point. And again, that's why I'm so bullish on agent frameworks. They help you with the flow engineering piece. And beyond just prompt engineering, now we're talking about flow engineering, and that's a whole separate art and science in itself. And it's still very early days. We're still trying to figure out what types of flows work well, how many agents work well together, is there a maximum, is there a minimum, how should they plan, what steps should they execute? So it's still early, it's still really fun to watch. The next thing that I want to talk about is the UX of a lot of agent applications. This is actually one area I'm really excited about. I don't think we've kind of nailed the, the right way to interact with these agent applications. I think uh, 
human in the loop is kind of still necessary because they're not super reliable. And I wanna talk about human in the loop. So I work with large companies, helping them with their AI strategy and consistency and reliability and quality is insanely important to them. And when you're talking about large language models, hallucinations are almost guaranteed. So how do you avoid them? Well, there's a few ways. Again, agent frameworks help you really reduce hallucinations through things like caching, through prompt libraries, through obviously reducing the temperature of the large language model, but also human in the loop. And that's really important, especially to large enterprise companies. And I don't think human in the loop is gonna go away anytime soon. But as Harrison says, if you have too much human in the loop, basically you're removing all of the automation. And there's this fine balance of where you actually need human in the loop. And I think it's essentially whenever you have a deliverable, whenever the agents produce something, that is substantial and is a piece of something that will be delivered and relied upon within the organization. And so that's something I'm still experimenting with is what the optimal human in the loop strategy is. But if it's in the loop too much, then it's not actually doing that much useful thing. So there's kind of like a weird balance there. One UX thing that I really like uh, from from Devin, uh, which came out you know a, a week two weeks ago. And speaking of Devin, as much virality as they had, and a, as much dunking as they had, and people calling it out as actually like doing less than what they've shown in the demo, the UX is fantastic. And shortly after Devin, we had Devika and Open Devin. So obviously they did something right with showing all of the screens, the browser, the chat window, the terminal, the code, all in one screen. That was obviously a really powerful. UI because it was copied and a lot of people like it. So I think this is immediately one of the big contributions of seeing the Devon demo was just everybody realized, oh, this is a great way to structure the user interface. Um, and, and, and Jordan B kind of like uh, put this nicely on Twitter is, is the presence of like a rewind and edit ability. So you can basically go back to a point in time where the edit or where the agent was and then edit what it did or edit the state that it's in so that it can make a more informed decision. And I think this is a really, really powerful UX um, that we're really excited about uh, at LangChain and exploring this more. And I think this brings a little bit more reliability, um, but at the same time, kind of like steering ability to the agents. So let's talk about being able to rewind and change things. Uh, I agree. This is a really incredible user experience because there are some times where you kind of go off in a path in a direction and you find that that was not the right thing to do. So let's go back and start from this state. And I've seen one project do this incredibly well and they've actually been a sponsor of this channel, but it comes to mind because they really do do it so well, which is Pythagora. And that was the AI coding assistant that I've shown you before. And Pythagora has this ability to basically rewind to any step along the entire journey of a project and you can start from there, you can edit it and continue on from there. So really cool. And that's kind of what Devin does. That's also what Harrison is talking about. I think that's going to be a very strong piece of agent coordination. And I can't wait until all of the agent frameworks build that in. Speaking of kind of like steering ability, the, the last thing I want to talk about is the memory of, of agents. Um, and so Mike uh, at Zapier showed this off a, a little bit earlier where he was basically interacting with the bot and kind of like teaching it what to do and correcting it. And so this is an example where I'm teaching um, in a chat setting an AI to kind of like write a tweet in a specific style. And so you can see that I'm just correcting it in natural language to get to a style that I want. I then hit thumbs up. The next time I go back to this application, it, it remembers the style that I want, but I can keep on editing it. I can keep on making it a little more differentiated. And then when I go back a third time, it remembers all of that. And so this I would kind of classify as kind of like procedural memory. So it's remembering the correct way to do something. I think another really important aspect is, is basically personalized memory. So remembering facts about a human that you might not necessarily use to, to do something more correctly, but you might use to make the experience kind of like more personalized. Um, so this is an example kind of like journaling app that, that we're building and playing around with for exploring memory. And you can see that I mentioned that I went to a cooking class and it remembers that I like Italian food. And so I think bringing in these kind of like personalized aspects, um, whether it be procedural or, or kind of like these personalized facts, will be really important for the next generation of agents. Um, that's all I have. 
So that is both long-term and short-term memory. In the short term, you should be able to go back and forth with an agent or allow the agents to go back and forth with each other and they can learn and improve along the way. And that might be also where human in the loop comes in, you can kind of steer them. But then we have long-term memory, which is also really important, not only for personalization, but also within the context of businesses and enterprise. The ability for these agents to learn things, to have obviously the company's knowledge at hand at any time, but that's just rag, but basically learn that and use that memory for the foreseeable future is a really powerful feature that is being built into or is already built into many agent frameworks. And that's something I'm really excited about. Now, there's a lot of complexity there. How much do you store? How do you write the rules for when to forget something? Or do you ever forget something? How do you change a memory? Businesses change all the time. So the memory has to evolve with the business's needs. And again, all of this is very early. It's so raw right now. So just having the ability to give it long-term and short-term memory and using flow engineering and tools and all of these things, it's possible, but I think there's not really a tried and true path yet. People are still figuring out what is the best combination, what is the optimal combination of you know whatever we're talking about, long-term memory, short-term memory, tools, number of agents, different large language models. Should you use different ones in the same workflow? There's so many cool questions yet to be answered. And so that's it. That's his whole talk. Uh, this was a great talk. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you liked this video, please consider giving a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.